Okay. So I'm right before the keynote, so hopefully you guys aren't going to want this break or this um, fire alarm that's coming around 4.30. So we might all be cut halfway through. Um, so today I'm going to be here to talk to you about strategy and the strategy journey and what that has to do with Umbraco. And I wanted to start with this quote, which is, success is a journey, not a destination. So fairly often people think, oh, OK, I'm playing a game, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a project. And they think of the, the end story. They go straight to, this is what it's going to be. They don't actually think about what it takes to actually get there. And it's actually the journey that you take step by step, however long it might take, that actually provides the value and gives you the rewards before you get to the destination. So I'm actually going to start with a little story about games. So who's a gamer here? Who plays games? Lots of gamers. Call of Duty, Dune. Anybody heard of the game called Small World? Not a lot. OK. Small World is not a computer game. It's a board game. And it's actually a strategy board game that is very similar to Risk. And there's goblins and creatures with special powers. And it's a strategy game. And there's about 10 rounds in it. And I love playing this game, both as a board game and also online. So it is actually um, a game you can play on your iPad. Um, and I, I love playing it because I have, well, I think I love playing it because I have a very good win-loss record, at least an 80 90% win-loss record. Well, but the, the thing is, I, I play it fairly often with my other half, and he keeps getting really, really frustrated every time he plays me, just like when we were in Vegas last year. And he spent a couple of hours learning about the rules of um, blackjack so we could hit the tables and really understand how he could win at blackjack. Um, but yet, maybe we broke even. And so it's the strategy behind a game like Small World that I love, step by step, round by round. There's all these different powers and creatures that you can actually take. Um, and you, you, you actually need to win round by round. The journey of winning each round, based on the number of op opponents I've eaten um, in the game, versus you know, actually counting the number of coins that I have to win till the end of the game, is actually what I really, really enjoyed about playing Small World compared to, say, actually winning the game. And I don't actually count. I don't actually think of the destination. It's nice if I win at the end, but it's actually each round, how many opponents have I actually eaten that I really enjoy. So you look at all the gamers out there. Do they really, really enjoy what happens when they've finished the game and they've moved on to the next round? Or do they enjoy the journey of going through each you know, um, obstacle, each game, game by game, shooting all these various different opponents? It is the journey that matters. And success, in most people's minds, and it's a matter of mindset, subconsciously, is actually the journey, not the destination. So a little bit about me. Who am I, and why am I here speaking to you today about strategy? This is a collage of all the things that are important to me. So you can see Small World down there. And then you see Canary Wharf and Banks at the top. So today, I've been asked to come and speak to you because I'm supposed to know a thing or two about strategy. I've actually been working as a strategist for the past 10 odd years, mainly for a number of banks, um, as well as Fortune 500 companies. In many cases, as the chief of staff assisting the CEO or the head of change or the COO, looking at their propositions, their go-to-market strategy, changing how their clients, you know, wh where they serve their clients and various different things. So hopefully that you know, gives me a little bit of experience to talk a little bit about strategy. The other thing I love about strategy, and you, you hear a lot about why I love strategy and then how I'm going to talk about what that means from a career perspective for developers, as well as then what strategy means for you as a developer and what you would do for your clients. So the other thing that I love is obviously football. Um, the strategy behind football is actually another thing that I've been studying for a really long time. And the most technically proficient player um, happens to be one of my favorite players, uh, Metsu Ursel from Arsenal. Sorry, non-Gunners fans. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I like Liverpool too, so not so much the Manchester, Manchester clubs. But the strategy behind football is actually something that I've written a lot about and studied a lot about. Um, if you ever, ever get a hold of Sir Alex, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson's book, 
um, or hear him speak if you understand the Glaswegian or the, the Scottish accent, the very thick accent that he has, then you actually hear a lot about what he, you know, what, what he's done in the, fo in, in the football industry, not just in, in managing Manchester United. But, but there's, there's a lot to it. And again, yes, it's all great when you're the Premiership winner or you're World Cup winner, as the Germans are, in the destination. But actually, everybody talks about the, the journey there as well. So it took a lot for the German football team. And, and apparently, they stole the strategy from England. We, we came up with this grand strategy as well to win the World Cup um, 12 years ago or, or, or 14 years ago, two years before the Germans started a, applying it. But they actually applied it. Apparently, we didn't. So um, hence, you know, England didn't quite make it, and Germany became the World Cup champions. So again, Formula One, another one of my interests, loads and loads of strategy, and another really interesting book that's coming out or just came out, which is a book written by Ross Braun. And he talks about the strategy behind Form Formula One, the politics, um, you know, all the ups and downs of what's actually happening, what it actually takes. I'm actually going to use a lot of Formula One examples in today's talk, mainly because I think it's an industry that's very, very interesting in terms of what it provides from an innovation perspective, from a strategy perspective, and, and from understanding your customers and, and the mindset. Obviously, I've traveled you know, to, across the world to many, many different places. And, and in the other aspect of strategy that's really important is culture. You will need to understand the cultural differences of who your customers are in order to be able to build the right software, to be able to build the right products and solutions that adhere to and align to the strategy of what it is that they're trying to achieve. Um, picture of Star Wars, you know, again, long journey, heroine or hero goes through adversity. We don't remember at the end the fact that there's always a happy ending and, you know, they've saved the world from the, the evil empire. We actually remember the journey that they go through. Um, computing, so I may actually be here talking to you about strategy day, but actually a little bit about me. I am actually originally a software engineer. So I did engineering and I used to code 10 years ago. Um, and decided when I used to be coding, um, because thought I wasn't so good at it, I was very, very frustrated in not understanding the client's requirements properly or understanding the underlying fundamental reason why I was doing what I was doing. So imagine if you're given um, a project and a piece of work to do and you're sitting there and you go, okay, I've got so much code, so many things to do, so many things to write, but then you actually want to understand, well, how can I make this better? What value does it actually bring? And fairly often, a lot of coders and developers don't get that insight into the underlying strategy behind the customer that they're supporting and then what it is that they're actually working on, what value does that bring, and what is that contribution. Now, it's not just developers, it's everybody. Everybody in, a, in any organization, big or small, if you fundamentally understand the strategy and the journey that, that your client, your business, is going through, you're going to be more aligned to it. You're going to share the values associated with it, and you're going to enjoy it more, and you're going to become better, and you're going to produce more value as well. So coding, um, you know, computers, very, very interesting to me because having gone the route from a career perspective, originally being a coder, and wanting to be in strategy and in business, I slowly moved from that to becoming a business analyst. I then became a project manager to, for, for, you know, um, managing some projects at some of the banks and various other, um, you know, as well as uh, General Electric. And then I actually started moving into strategy, sitting outside the CRO's office, helping him to decide which projects to fund, um, you know, who, who, who gets to, to do what, helped change his opinion on why certain things related to a project might not go his way, and that fact convincing him that actually his ideas are not necessarily always the right one. He needs to listen more, or she needs to listen more, to the people, as well as finding out fundamentally what the client actually wants, or the customer actually wants. And then finally, to one of my favorite TV series, Silicon Valley. Um, I'm sure, you know, I saw it earlier in the community room. Um, they were showing a video of, of one of the characters on a unicorn and horse. It was really fun. And everybody, well, I hope everybody likes the series Silicon Valley. Now, I particularly like it uh, for, for two reasons. One is I've embarked, having gone from a techie into strategy into corporate, um, I quit 
and I went and started my own business about a year ago and back into tech. So I've realized that fundamentally my passion is for technology and for tech. And so there's a lot of home truths, even though they make a lot of jokes in Silicon Valley, about what actually goes on in the minds of a small team and the strategy and everything else. It's, it's a mess. But what, what's really interesting about Silicon Valley um, is, has anybody not seen the last episode of the last season? And I'm breaking the story to them. Do you want to hold your ears for a second, unless you don't want to hear? So in the last episode of Silicon Valley, um, or the last two episodes, the team have realized that they're bu building the wrong product. They've been building a product for engineers and not for the general public. So when they actually did some user testing for their product, they started realizing um, that people didn't understand how to use their product. Um, so apparently there was, I don't know, how many million invested in the business. And it was all going to waste because they didn't take the effort to understand the customer. And they, they saw engineers as being the customer, even though they were fundamentally building a, an encryption product for the general public. So it just shows you, right, that you know, strategy is something that actually startups and, and businesses and clients and everybody else needs to think about. And it does actually fairly often start with understanding what the clients want. So, Failure is something that actually happens in a lot of businesses. Now, I know failure is probably not the topic you want to hear about, having come to a, a talk about strategy, but it happens a lot. These are all statistics that you can find on the internet. I haven't invented these. I'm sure you've heard them all before. Eight in 10 startups fail in their first two years. 50% of new businesses fail in the first five years. Nine in 10 internet and tech startups fail in their first 120 days. And on the corporate side, big businesses fail just as often. It's just that they hide it very, very well. Nearly 75% of all corporate projects fail to deliver on their strategic objectives. And similarly, 53% of all operating mod mo uh, model projects fail because of an unclear strategy. There's actually a lot of failure. Um, according to a statistic from the Project Management um, Association, the, the world one, you know, the big one, um, about a billion is spent on projects a year, and yet 75% of them fail, if the statistics are right. It's a lot of wastage. Yes, it pays for all our salaries for those of us who work in corporates or, or various different businesses, but actually 75% of all the output and the, of, of the product of all these projects is actually ending up in not very much at all, um, which is, I guess, not a very, very good thing. If you think about that, that's a lot of money wasted. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, because what I want to talk about is the fact that failure is a good thing. So Michael Jordan once came up with the quote, well, I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Failure is actually a necessity, because that's how you learn. Learning and understanding failure and, and, and failing fast is actually one of the keys to success. So don't, don't worry about you know, all the failure and the fact that you, work, you, know, you may or may not have been working on, on failed projects, as long as you've learned from it, um, and as long as you can find value in what you're doing. So, so one of the things in, in being you know, in the software engineering and, and technology industry is that you really, really need to understand the strategy, and hence I go back into why that's important. Okay, so why the strategy journey? So you'll see, back to my F1 analogies, there's a little, very ordinary little red car, and it says, my vision is to win races, and I need a Ferrari. Okay, if you're a Red Bull fan, or, or some, you know, if you follow Mercedes, because Lewis Hamilton doesn't drive for a Ferrari, but I happen to really love Ferrari. Um, and plus, at the moment, we do have a, a mini, a red mini as a little red car on the latest Top Gear episodes. And then you've got your Ferrari. But the truth is, as I said before, strategy alone isn't success, OK? It's actually a lot more than that. Success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out, another quote. So success is all about, and strategy, and, and achieving with strategy is all about loads and loads of little wins, not a big win. 
So the bigger your, you know, so, so again, you, you look at, um, I know it's, you know, fictional, um, but you look at the episode of Star Wars and the bad guys always come up with this big strategy to take over the world and blow everybody up. The bigger it is, the more likely it is that the failure is fatal. Whereas actually, if you think about strategy and, and working through your projects and loads and loads of little iterations and little sequences and you think of every single cycle that you go through it as win, if you, if you win, and if you fail, then, well, you know, you've learned from it, and, but you, it's, it's been a quick cycle. Then, then actually, over time, you can accumulate lots and lots of little wins and mitigate not so many little losses. And hopefully, through that, you will actually be able to accumulate a really big win. So again, you know, it, it might be fictional, it might be storytelling, but you see all the rebels in Star Wars constantly going through in adversity, not quite winning it, but then they keep going at it because they have to. And then eventually they win because they find out through strategy um, a little you know, loophole in, in what's actually happening in, in, in the Death Star and then they shoot in the right place by pure luck. Now, I'm not saying that um, from a strategy perspective there isn't a luck when it comes to business success as well, but we'll, you know, that's, that's certainly the case, but you know, it's all about loads and loads of little wins. So, back to you know, what I think strategy really is, Str or, or success. Success, as I said, is loads and loads of little wins. And it's about strategy, depending on your definition of what it actually is. I take that as being purely just, well, what are we going to do? This is how we think we might apply it to the actual execution of it, and then to mindset. Now, again, Strategy without execution, you know, everybody talks about that. You can, you can, the, there's all these consultants. I've been uh, called many names myself in some of the corporates that I've worked with. Um, you know, she's just a consultant. She's just going to write us a pretty PowerPoint diagram and then we'll just put it in the cupboard and never worry about it again because nobody's ever actually going to execute it or do anything. So strategy without execution is certainly not going to lead to success. The other thing is mindset. It's up actually about will. Now, Again, culturally, I worked at these very large organizations. Not all of them are bad, by the way, just mostly the banks. Um, the, you know, I really had a good time working for General Electric um, and, and several others as well. But primarily, the banks are not so good. I mean, if you go on LinkedIn and have a look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll see bank, 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 ooh, fail bank, not, so, not doing so well. Ooh, they might fail soon, Deutsche Bank, for example. Um, but, Mindset is, is really, really important. Now, mindset is, is not just the mindset of the individuals, but it's the mindset of the organization or the business that you're working in. Or your client. They have to have the right mindset to succeed. They have to have almost like a growth mindset. And again, there's a really, really good book written by Carol Dweck um, on the growth mindset, which I highly recommend everybody read, mainly because there's, um, you know, depending if you're in the startup scene uh, or if you're one of your clients is actually a startup and you're, you're coding or building something for them and they're funded. There are a lot of venture capitalist funds out there as well as um, accelerators who use Carol Dweck's book now as a means to understand their candidates before they accept them into their um, actual accelerator. So it's, it's, a, it's quite an interesting thing because they're trying to get to see whether these people are investable and it is about people more than anything. But Again, back to mindset. In an organization, if the culture is wrong, if the people are having some sort of negative attitude, if they're not proactive and if their suggestions aren't being listened to, and if there's this statement that says, this is how things are always done here, you know, it's never going to change, then we've got a problem. Um, that's not going to lead to success. It will lead to that other 75% of failure that might actually happen in those organizations. But you'll see, the, the point of, I guess, the, the Formula One analogy is that how do I transform this very ordinary car is something that, you know, if you had an ordinary car or if you were a small car manufacturer, you would think about. And again, that's the, the very same thing with business as well. If your clients are small, they're going to be thinking about how they're going to transform their very, very small businesses into something a little bit better. Now, when they are a little bit better, then their mindset goes into how do I get even better and faster? Okay, so again, you know, we might be talking about a little car here, but actually it applies to business. It actually even applies to your career. Um, you know, you start off not knowing very much and then you gain experience and then you, you work on how you might get a little bit better. And then finally, even if you were Ferrari and they're not winning everything, I mean, 
you know, um, the, the last Grand Prix, Sebastian Vettel had a big incident with Max Verstappen and um, they almost took each other out. And Ferrari came third and it was this big cheer because they came third and maybe certain people won't get fired as a result of it because they managed to get third. So again, it's all about back to the whole mindset and loads, about loads of little, little wins. Now, I want to align this little, little wins analogy to, I guess, the agile process. So agile as a project management methodology talks very much about how you, know, there's, you, you, you need to iteratively go through the various different steps that it takes to actually achieve the end result. And I was actually just in um, the estimation, forecasting, and planning talk um, for a little bit um, about an hour ago. And there was a little conversation about, how, about the agile process and how actually, you know, um, whether you should or shouldn't build a buffer into it. And, and, and what the project management industry or, or, or understanding your clients means and everything else. But actually, whether it's business, whether it's a project, um, to some extent, indirectly, however you want to interpret Agile, Agile is you know, little incremental improvements, and that's actually a fundamental aspect of how you achieve things and how you should break down a strategy in order to apply it. So now what is the strategy journey? So um, it's taken me a long time, sorry, 20 minutes to get to you know, what I call the strategy journey. And I've broken it down into five steps. And this is, this is, these five, five steps is actually an accumulation of all the different projects that I've worked on, both for large corporates, from General Electric to the banks, to some of the startups that I advise, to my own startup. There are actually five steps. The first one, um, and, and like I said, no matter the size, they all apply. The first one is motivation and leadership. Without that, fundamentally, you haven't actually got a project. You have, there's no reason for starting it. You haven't got a business. So it's really, really important that there is that level of motivation and that somebody takes charge to say, yes, I'm going to do this project. Yes, I'm going to set up this business. Yes, I'm going to do this. So is, you know, that, that's the fundamental step. Fairly often, there's a lot of um, businesses then who actually start at the second stage and they go into business design because they're very product oriented businesses. So again, your clients or yourselves, if, if, you, if you work for a small um, agency you know, and you're in, on the business stream, you have to think about your business model and your business design. And that is actually quite a challenging thing because people jump to product. They jump to what they deliver, not does, is this actually going to make money? Is this actually profitable? Does this actually fulfill what the client actually wants or the customer actually wants? And fairly often, businesses, be it large corporates or, or banks, <laughs> they certainly don't know what their customers want, um, other than, you know, you need to store your money somewhere and I need to lend you money. But they don't understand the, you know, the actual real needs of their customer. And no matter how many dogs they put on their ads, so every time you look at a banking ad on TV, do you not see a little puppy trying to jump at you? They think that that will bond with you, but actually, um, you know, the, the truth is that, that a little puppy on an ad isn't going to change anything about what the banks are actually doing at all. But, you know, they're trying. So, so the, the business design is the second step. The third one, um, and it's actually the, the key, actually, to the whole um, five stages, is the one that holds both sides together. So startups tend to operate in the first two sides, and actually large incumbent organizations tend to operate on this side. They keep transforming, they keep running big projects that don't achieve anything. They keep trying to say that they're going to change their business model or their operating model, and then nothing much changes. The reason why those two don't join up is because, especially in large organizations, they're huge and they're big, and they're stuck here, and nobody is focused on the middle section. So the middle section is actually value design. Value design is actually about understanding your business or your client's business, and where does it sit in the entire ecosystem or value chain that it belongs to? Now, this, I don't know if that's a, a technical term. Um, you know, d does anyone know what I'm talking about when I talk about value chains or, or value streams? Or lots of blank faces here. OK. So, so, so the, the value chain is, is essentially, think of it as a process or think of it as a network. So um, another way to think of it is 
Think of the car industry, back to my Formula One, and think of the supply chain that actually supports how you build a car. There's parts that you have to get, um, there's design that you have to do, you know, in engineering, then there's the build process, then there's the testing process. Oh, that sounds like the system development life cycle as well. Um, and then there's, there's, there's the, you know, the, the actual uh, go live and the delivery. And then after that, you actually have to support. There's, there's aftercare you know, with, the, with, with customers. There's aftercare support. That is actually an example of a value chain. Um, now, so you actually, in, in, in looking at some of the software, every time you build a piece of software, you're actually going through a value chain. But that is the value chain for the software development industry. You know, it actually, you know, for, for, for your particular business. The value network goes beyond that. The value network actually takes your value chain for your project or your business or your role, and it goes into your entire industry. So it starts attaching the things at the front and, the, and, and, and beyond. So again, take, for example, as a coder um, or a developer, or if you're in uh, user experience design, you have a role and you fit across this um, software development, design, process as such. But actually before that, fundamentally before it even happens, somebody's got to come up with an idea that needs this. There's also people coming up with new languages, people training um, you know, to become developers. There's more and more of these new uh, development schools that are popping up um, that teach people to code in Ruby um, and then call them developers. No offense, Ruby developers. Uh, <laughs> But you know, you know what I mean. Um, so, so it's, it's you know, there, there is a, a fundamentally a very, very long value chain, and how you position yourself if you are a business, or how you understand how your clients positioned within that value network and the value chain, will help fundamentally help you to understand how you can better um, find the right solutions for them. Be it especially if you are looking at user experience design. And obviously then, if you're coding, what does that actually mean? So, so though that is actually what joins business, the business design and the motivation and the leadership with the operations of an actual business and, and, and actually uh, what happens there. Now, if, these, if those two sides don't talk to each other, it's fundamentally because they don't actually understand how they join up together. And actually, the value chain and the value stream uh, is exactly how that happens. Then we've got business architecture. So that's more about operations. That's about you know, fundamentally what teams do you have, what's the structure, um, who does what, where. And obviously, that's where most of the politics actually happens in, in many organizations. Somebody mentioned to me today, even you know, in, in some of the agencies, when people move in and out, you know, there's, there's often a little bit of friction, a little bit of politics. There's obviously a lot more politics that happens in some of the large organizations and, and big egos and you know, um, fulfilling what the, the paymaster actually wants. Um, so, so it's, but, but fundamentally, business architecture is actually all about the capabilities that people actually have in, in a business. And development, coding, and all the different roles that you actually have in, in the software development industry are a set of capabilities, probably in one or two departments within an organization. Then there's marketing, there's you know, um, the sales guys themselves, all those different departments. It takes more than just one little team of developers to actually make an entire business function. Um, it also takes much more than a sales team to make an entire business function because they might be selling nothing. And similarly, if marketeers are out there marketing for the sake of marketing, and I actually, funnily enough, I, w I once worked on a project in Australia um, for a bank, but a very innovative one at that. And actually, some of the software that we developed there still doesn't exist in the UK, and it's like 12 years later now. And I've been, for the last couple of years, I've been trying to convince some of the banks to do something similar, but they still haven't done it. Um, so Australian banks are you know, um, a little bit more innovative and advanced. And all it was was a, an online platform to be able to auto-decision and onboard a customer within 90 minutes. So an Australian bank can actually onboard a customer and give you instant decisioning if you fill in the criteria. And your loan could be approved within those 90 minutes, and you could settle within two days. And that's for a mortgage, if you met all the conditions. Now here, that isn't the case. There's a minimum you know, length and, and, and all that kind of time. But anyway, back to the, back to, you know, um, the, the analogy. 
the, the, oper the, the marketing team back 10 years ago, because there was a competitor, um, I think it was TD Waterhouse or something like that, it was an online disruptor who went on and actually talked about how they can do instant decisioning in 20 minutes. So this particular bank who had the majority of the Australian mortgage market decided that, oh my God, we are going to say the same thing. Now a marketeer doesn't know how long it takes to code an entire platform from nothing, but she made an announcement to the whole of Australia that by next July, and I think it was maybe like September, that this bank would be able to do instant decisioning in 20 minutes like the online competitor and told the whole world and all the marketing messages went out and there wasn't even any funding yet for that program. Um, I was actually really young at the time. I got on as one of the uh, designers and you know, we were working madly and, and finally somebody took notice because actually it, was the, it did make 80% of, of that bank's profits. It was actually an important product. So everybody threw all their resources at it in order for it to succeed. But you know, it just shows you right, that there's actually different components to actually understanding what it takes to succeed in business. And then finally, transformation. So every project that you actually ever work on is part of the transformation process of whether a business, be it yours or your clients. Um, and what I want to talk about is how quickly you cycle through this. So in the, um, I guess in my studies and in, the, in, in some of the research that I've been doing, not just through the examples that I've given you in terms of where I've worked, but also I've been working with quite a number of different people in Tech London Advocates and in the industry to really understand how you know, uh, a lot of different businesses and where they sit across their value chain and where they might you know, be traversing through the strategy journey. So I've talked a lot about strategy as a journey, and I fundamentally believe that every single business every single project, every single individual, at any point in time, you are constantly on a journey and you are constantly applying a strategy to that journey because you're thinking about how you're gonna improve or get through it if it's really horrible or get better at it and you're learning. And what I've done is that I've broken those five stages into five specific models that um, I think are a way that you can shape and understand how you could actually get through that strategy journey better. Now, one of the key things I talked about before is, you see that little arrow with the word pivoting on it. So startups, specifically in small businesses, but even large ones, they spend a lot of time between those two stages pivoting. Um, or actually, they go through the whole thing very quickly and they start again. So again, they need to be nimble and they need to be agile. So, you know, taking my own startup as an example, um, since we started in January, uh, at the beginning of this year, we've really changed our business model like three times, four times. We've changed our products. We've actually been testing our products with about 80 people. Um, you know, and each time they give us the feedback and we're pivoting to, through it. So essentially, I'm trying to get through this as quickly as possible because by getting through it as quickly as possible, and obviously, hopefully, applying my own you know, methodology that I've been sort of developing and, and taking and understanding how businesses are moving through this, I'm able to, the faster I move through it, the more likely I am to get the little wins so that eventually I get a big enough one or I've accumulated little, in, little wins, which I talked about, to get to getting a, a more significant win, which is that all of a sudden the, the platform and the app that we eventually build when we, you know, goes viral and then we get investors and we get money and you know, um, I might get a Series A funding of some ridiculous number, <laughs> like in Silicon Valley, and hopefully I don't waste it, and then I end up being a unicorn. Oh, that's my dream. So <laughs> talking about that, the five models that I want to talk about are the mission, the business, the value, the operating, and the transformation. Um, they align to each of those five steps of the strategy journey, and the mission model, you know, there's a lot of businesses, be it your clients, and you ask them, or even the project, and you ask them, what's the purpose of what it is that you're trying to achieve? And they go, I don't know. So then you go, well, why am I coding this, or working on this, or doing this, if there is no fundamental mission and vision? Now, take Apple and Steve Jobs' original mission statement. Does anybody know what that is? It's actually really, really cool. It says to build tools for the mind that advance humankind. 
Now, if you didn't know that that came from Steve Jobs, and if this was the 1970s, don't you think that was a little bit crazy for a mission statement? But that is exactly what he did. He built tools for the mind that advance humankind, um, be it the iPad. You know, he's, it's fundamentally, uh, starting with the iPod, and then now the iPad. It's fundamentally changed how you know, we as humans <laughs> communicate with each other with our phones and our iPads and everything else. What Steve and, and some of the greats out there do with the mission and vision statement is that they are bold, they are radical, but they say something that brings followers with them. Okay? They bring people who want to believe that that is possible. And, and in building such an amazing mission and vision, then you get your followers. You, your followers are your customers. They are your staff. They are your team. They are you know, your, all the people around you. And, and actually, if you think about it, you know, the whole Twitter and Facebook phen phenomenon and, and how everybody's just trying to accumulate followers, oh, but I don't know how that's quite working out for some people because I know some people claim that they have hundreds of thousands of followers, but I was like, really? You know, does that actually change anything in your bottom line um, of your actual business? Maybe it does for some people, maybe it doesn't. So mission is really, really, really important. Business model, I'm not going to talk a lot about that because there's some great stuff out there. You know, there's um, a really great book um, called The Business Model Generation, written by a Swiss guy called um, Alexander Osterwalder. And um, he's got like a million people downloading this business model canvas where you can sort of understand and align what your actual business model actually is. Um, and he's got loads and loads of videos and cartoons on the internet showing people the, the benefits and the examples of it. And I actually, you know, used it myself. But fundamentally, if you build a business, you need to understand your customers. You need to know what they want, and you need to understand the customer model, which he definitely talks about, and then make sure that you're building a product or service that is exactly what the customer wants, within limits, of course. Sometimes the customer doesn't really know what they want. They can't even explain that to you. And if they don't know what they really, really want, they have a, a vague idea and they can't explain it to you, that actually impacts your, um, your process. Because if you are on the receiving end of a project where the customer is unclear about their needs, and again, we talked about this in the estimation, forecasting, and planning um, workshop earlier today, how are you going to be able to estimate, plan, and quote appropriately? And what about all the scope creep that comes? Because every time you do an iteration and you develop something, all of a sudden, uh, the customer comes back to you, and then they actually say, oh, OK, I want more, or I want this change, or I want that change. And it wasn't part of what you fundamentally wanted. So understanding the customer is really, really important. I talked about the value chains, the value networks in detail and, and, and their importance. This is where you understand who your competitors are. This is where you understand who, who are the potential partners that you can work with. Operating model, again, we talked a little bit about that. Um, in terms of, you know, it, it takes a very large team to actually get a business going, and there's actually loads of different stakeholders that you need to work with when you work on any project. And then finally, transformation is really about, you know, projects, changing things, continuous change, and improving and learning. So the only way to, to win is to learn faster than anyone else. So Eric Ries wrote The Lean Startup. Um, I only read it recently, even though I'd heard so many things about it, uh, for ages, and actually it fundamentally uh, created a shift in me in the way that I was running my own startup, having worked for some large organizations and actually built some bad habits myself in the way I was functioning and moving very, very slowly. But it is, you know, the, the, the strategy journey shows you that with you follow the five steps and you go through it and you do it as quickly as possible and you learn, then that's how you're going to get better. And you can apply that in so many different ways, be it yourself or um, you know, on your career, on the client that you're working in, on the project that you're working in. And if you think about the strategy journey and you use it in how you actually think about your projects and understand it and you, you, you take the effort to learn it, uh, to, to learn the different components of it for the client that you're working on or the business that you're working on, then you're going to create agility. You're going to be able to take accountability and there's going to be a lot more action. So again, back to my Formula One analogy, it's one of the few industries that is truly, truly agile, if you take the word agile by all its, you know, in its truest sense. Because they have the ability 
to be able to change mid-race with a tweak of button, not all the time, but most of the time, the aerodynamics of the car to adhere to the wind conditions that, or, or sudden you know, amount of rain that may have come to actually impact what's actually happening in that race that changes the tire pressure mid-race, let alone, you know, and then, and then you see some other projects who are supposedly agile and some new thing comes along and then you can't really shift it. That's not agile. So um, I've talked about my five models, sort of explained to you why, you know, understanding the strategy journey is really, really important. Um, and hopefully a little bit about how you can actually apply it to, um, you know, what you do, be it in software development, be it in business. There are definitely ways that you can apply it. It's the, the important thing is to understand it and understand that actually the five steps are there to help you. Now, there isn't time to cover off some of these um, examples or worksheets that I've actually built. Um, they are actually, um, I'm in the process of uh, writing a workbook and a book that will actually have some of these different artifacts in it. Um, so you can see there's the, the mission model and it, it, it shows you there's a little bit of a journey and how you can actually build that out to really understand what are the mission, vision and goals of an actual business. Um, and then the, the other one is the customer journey map, which is actually really, really, really useful because if you can understand what your customers think and how to move them, be they at, you know, if, if you're trying to get new business at awareness stage to versus them being advocates and helping you with repeat business and looking at what sorts of touch points that you need to actually um, be able to get them to uh, you know, understand them and, and get them to buy from you and, and continue to buy from you and not, not even sell for you, then you're in a very good, you're in a very good way. You're, you're on your way to success. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you very much. And um, I am in the process of writing this book, which is proving to be a real challenge. Writing a book is not as easy as I thought it would be. Um, so it is now coming out in 2017. Uh, but in the meantime, if you have uh, any questions and you want to know a little bit more about what the strategy journey is, you can go to the website. And at the moment, we're also um, providing some free downloads, especially of that customer journey map. Thank you very much.